I graduated with my physics degree about 15 years ago. And looking back, I remember really struggling through the course. My mathematics fundamentals were patchy, which meant I was always playing catch up in lectures. I'd often find myself cramming for exams at the end of the year, and I'd always study alone, I'd never study in groups. But through these experiences, and over the past 15 years, I feel I can share with you some useful tips on how to study physics more effectively, and hopefully with less stress. Okay, so these two books cover pretty much everything that you need for the first year in undergraduate physics. In fact, these were my first year undergraduate books back in 2005. I do recommend two online books as well, which are free and very good quality, and I'll get to these in a minute. But this was my main physics book for my first year, and it's called Physics for Scientists and Engineers with Modern Physics by Selway and Jewett, and this is their sixth edition. If we go to the contents, you'll see that it's split up into six parts, and you'll cover these over two semesters. Now, this is a 1,500-page book, and this first-year maths book that complements the modules in the first year is a similar size. So you really need to be strategic if you want to get through these books in two semesters. So in the first semester, you'll most likely cover classical mechanics, which includes oscillations and waves and thermodynamics. And the second semester will probably include electricity and magnetism, light and optics, as well as an introduction to modern physics, which includes relativity and quantum mechanics. But as you're going through these topics, you'll need to understand calculus. That also means having a firm foundation with pre-calculus, now, if you're like me, you would have studied pre-calculus in high school and would have quite quickly forgotten a lot of the minor details. But this book by K.A. Stroud does a fairly good job at filling in the gaps in their foundation section. And they also include two chapters on introductory calculus. Part two of this book covers pretty much all you need in the first year of a physics course and covers things like complex numbers, vectors, matrices, and a deeper dive into calculus and multivariable calculus, and so on. And you probably can see that I've marked a lot of the chapters with QM, which means that they were very useful when studying my quantum mechanics module. But if your foundational maths is quite patchy like mine was, I'd recommend Algebra and Trigonometry by OpenStax, because I think they do a far better job at describing pre-calculus than the Stroud book. OpenStax also has books on Calculus 1, 2, and 3, and these are completely free and good quality as well. Now, I would personally use the Stroud book and OpenStax books in conjunction and just go through each chapter to see what you've forgotten and just attempt as many questions as possible. Both books have lots of chapter questions with answers and you can quickly fill in the gaps of your mathematical knowledge. But as you go through these questions, I also recommend you use a spaced repetition technique. And this is something that I'll talk about in more detail in the following section. In fact, spaced repetition will ensure that when you study something, you won't have to restudy it again months down the line like it's new. But I think most importantly, if your maths is strong, then learning physics becomes much easier. Physics makes use of a lot of maths you learnt in high school that at the time might have seemed void of any useful application. I remember when I was in high school and I learnt maths, we would learn all these algorithms on how to solve certain problems, but we weren't shown how to apply these mathematical concepts in the real world. But physics makes use of many of these mathematical insights that you learnt in high school to build models of the natural world. And things eventually start to make sense when you combine maths and physics together. And this is because if you're studying physics without properly studying maths, you just have to believe things like the kinetic energy of a body is half mass times velocity squared. You don't have the mathematical knowledge to prove this equation yourself. And likewise, in maths, you may learn how to integrate a polynomial equation, but so what? How could you use this knowledge to better understand the natural world? And I think this is where physics comes in. So this wasn't true when I was at university, but when I study anything now, I incorporate a technique called space repetition, which involves systematically reviewing maths and physics questions at increasing intervals over time. And this method is probably the best I've found at enhancing long-term retention of any material that you're learning. Without this space repetition technique, it's really easy to study a topic at the beginning of the year and totally forget it by the exam time, which means you'll have to cram. And that's what happened to me. So let's say you're studying chapter two on heat engines, entropy, and the second law of thermodynamics. I'd first look at the problems at the end of the chapter, 
and see how many questions are in each section. So here, there are only nine questions in section 22.1 and 22.2. So I would focus on these two sections for this study period. Next, I would spend 20 or so minutes skimming through six pages that cover these two sections and get a general sense of what it's trying to teach me. I would then go to the end of chapter summary as this clarifies the main key takeaways that I need to learn. And I will also look at these questions on the next page. Now, these questions are relatively simple and are meant to be answered either in your head or if you're working with a partner to discuss out loud. The main purpose of these questions is to make sure that you're picking up the relevant details in the chapter sections and not missing anything out. I'll then go back to the chapter sections and read them more deeply and try and connect what I've learned previously from earlier chapters or any relevant maths that I've studied in the past. So I might ask, how does this material connect or relate to ideas in physics that may have been developed centuries before? Once I've attempted the quick quizzes and example problems, I'd find the answer, in this case, probably two easy questions and two intermediate questions from section 22.1 and one easy and one intermediate question from section 22.2. Now to ensure I come back to this area of physics later, I will create a flashcard which will tell me to review a new question from one of these sections. I think the last couple of things I want to mention is to try and read your undergraduate physics book along with this college physics book. The reason I'd do this is because Sir Wayne Jewett's book can be unnecessarily complicated sometimes. For example, on page 114, their definition of Newton's first law is stated like so. If an object does not interact with other objects, it's possible to identify a reference frame in which the object has zero acceleration. Now I feel this is overly complicated for a first year physics student. An OpenStax book has a more straightforward definition. A body at rest remains at rest, or if in motion, remains in motion at constant velocity unless acted on by a net external force. But again, this is just my personal opinion. You, you may disagree with this. And the very last thing, I would find yourself a study partner so you can discuss what you've learned or even take turns trying to teach each other. This way, not only would you be catching material that you've missed or misunderstood, you'll also provide each other with support during the first year of your physics degree. Anyway, that's it for now. Thank you so much if you've watched this far. And I'd like to hear about your experiences studying physics, whether you're in high school, university or studying outside of academia. So take care for now and I'll see you soon.